And I'm here to welcome uh, Dr. Joel Stagger, and he's going to talk to us today about um, habitual aquatic conditioning and the impact on age-related decline in both cognitive, neuromuscular, and cardiovascular function. Um, he is currently the director of the Councilman Center in the Human Performance Laboratory. Uh, he is interested in optimal aging, focusing on the habits and characteristics of highly active uh, older adults who just happen to swim. So thank you for coming to speak to us today. Thanks for coming. Can you hear me now? OK. Uh, I have a couple things I have to explain based on the question she asked me. I am at Indiana University, which in fact is in Bloomington, which is roughly an hour south of here, depending how fast you drive. There's another Indiana University that's here in Indianapolis, but it's known as Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis. And we're not allowed to use the word ooey pooey, but we do sometimes. We're local, we're allowed to say that. But trying to explain to you how Indiana University exists in at least, what do we say, eight, eight back doors, eight front doors, something like that. We have regional campuses. It just so happens that this is one of them. So I'm from Bloomington. The other, we call it IUB. All right, number two, you might recognize the uh, woman in the photograph there, maybe. She made press recently by being the first person to swim from Cuba to, there you go, from Florida. And she's no spring chicken, as they say, right? So that was entirely appropriate to have her on the, uh, on the front page here. The next thing I have on my little sheet here is that, and I mentioned over here once before, it's like you never want to see your name right above the cocktail hour. <laughs> But it occurred to me as I'm looking at the schedule at, at uh, the other options that you face. Uh, one is the missing link in regulation changes research, which is in a red headline. The next one over is code brown. And the next one over is reducing urination in the pools. But see, That's the big one, <laughs> exactly. But they missed an opportunity. They could have put that one in brown. And vice versa, right? Anyway, OK, moving along. All right, the Councilman Center. The Councilman Center has been around about a decade. And it's actually an outgrowth. Hopefully, people in here have heard of Doc Councilman. He was our swim coach for about, I'm going to say, 33 years or so. And you don't normally equate a Midwestern state as being the center of the aquatic universe, but he pretty much put us on the map. And he was all about swimming and all about swimmers. So this is a picture of uh, some of the individuals that have been uh, associated with the Councilman Center. And all but, I think, one is somewhere else today. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that we have about an equal number of students with us today, but the vast majority are from out of the United States. We have scholars from Japan, China, Taiwan, and Europe, and we have very few from the US. And it all has to do with this. So keep that in mind, unfortunately. OK. I have uh, three topics that we have to resolve today. The first one has to do with the fountain of youth. And I will admit, I got way too deep into this particular problem. The second one is actually convincing you of what is aging. And again, I probably got way too deep into that one as well. And the third, which is why you're all here, <laughs> is swimming or aquatic activity and what can it do for us. But number three is sort of like preaching to the choir. You know, a lot of times when I'm talking about this, the people that I'm talking to have nothing to do with swimming, and I have to convince them of that importance. So, OK, is there a fountain of youth? And a lot of these pictures come from a book called Aging is Not for Sissies. So you may be familiar with that. Great book. And have, I think there's actually a second edition, too. Great photographs. Well, OK, let's start with the fountain of youth. This is sort of background. Remember, it's Friday afternoon, right before cocktail hour. 
It turns out when you start looking for this information, it goes way, way back. And, in, and the first reports of the fountain of youth or uh, water as therapy goes back almost 2,000 years, which is kind of surprising. I have a, a copy of a, of a book here that was published in 1513 to show you how long ago people have been discussing this. It says, far to the west, beyond the bright blue ocean, an island upon which a tree with golden fruit grew. What does that sound like? Where did Diana and Ad, Ad swim to? All right, well. All right, so in the context of uh, bipartisan politics, uh, we're going we're gonna to say things haven't changed a whole lot in 500 years, as it turns out. So it turns out that Ponce de Leon was actually a sailor with the Columbus expeditions to the, to the New World. And of course, we should all know by now they weren't looking for the New World, right? They were looking for the Spice Islands and away to Asia. Nevertheless, when they got here, these guys, Columbus, etc., basically told everybody they found a quick route to India, right, in the Spice Islands. And so Columbus was never really willing to admit that he found anything different. But the bad news is when he goes home, he doesn't have anything to show for it other than, I think, cocoa leaves and pearls. But that's not what they were looking for, right? Anyway, one of the guys on the trip was this guy named Leon, who was a fierce fighter, became Ponce de Leon, right? And it turns out uh, he, uh, he had to make his mark, right, earn his stripes. And so he went out looking for, once again, the Spice Islands. It turns out that one of his competitors, to discredit him, told everybody that that wasn't the truth, that he was really looking for a, a fountain of youth because Ponce de Leon was impotent. So if you look at his logs, and people have studied this over a course of hundreds of years, there's absolutely no mention of any search for a fountain of youth. There's no discussion with the, with the Indians or the natives, nothing. So it all has to do with bipartisan. I'm competing with you. I'm going to make you look bad when I get back to Spain. And there we have. So nevertheless, and you can read all of this. That's basically what this says. He did find, quote, unquote, an island. And it just so happens that we know it as Florida, right? And it turns out it was fi almost 500 years ago. I think it says April, April 2nd or something like that. And it turns out the inhabitants, which everybody referred to as Indians, were actually um, tall, healthy, and lived much longer than the Spaniards. The average lifespan of the Spaniards at this point in time, a normal Spaniard, was about 34 years. And the sailors all lived about 28 years. And these guys, when they get to Florida, we're living 50, 60, 70 years. So who knows? Palm Sunday, 1513, Ponce de Leon took a possession of a great island he called Florida, and the rest is history. But what, uh, what do these Spaniards uh, attribute to Floridians living these long lives? Was it uh, clean living and sunshine, omega-3 fish oils, <laughs> vitamin C from the orange fruit, golden fruit, or plenty of cheap oceanfront property. So all possibilities, right? All right. So the conclusion from that is we've spent 500 years looking for the fountain of youth. Probably not going to happen, right? So we're going to check that one off the list. Aging. That's the number two thing that we have to discuss today. Um, this is a quote from Wallace Stegner. I'm Steger, he's Stegner. Um, is it a matter of killing time before time kills us? And that, that's, uh, I'll say, a, a behavioral choice, if you will. Um, is there something we can do about, about the aging process? And so that's, that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. You know what the uh, term Chautauqua means? I don't know if we have anybody from the East Coast. Chautauqua, there's a, a lake in up around west of New York, Chautauqua Lake, Mayville, New York. 
Um, you can go there for the summer. It's a uh, music, fine arts, writing, blah, 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 blah. But it's learning a lot in a short period of time. That's what a sh Chautauqua is. Okay, a couple terms here. The first one is average life expectancy at birth. All right, based on when you were born, there's a, an age that we can calculate in terms of what your, your average lifespan will be. All right, and that's time dependent and it's changing. But it turns out, and we'll talk about a little more, it has a lot to do with what's going on with the youngest within the population, not necessarily the oldest. So in other words, if you live to be 15, odds are you're going to live to be 25. If you live to be 25, odds are you're going to live to be 35, right? So if we can do something about neonatal health, we're going to increase the average life expectancy. But it really has nothing to do with the rest of us that are already old. Got that? All right. So that's been changing. And that's what this graph is, and we'll come back to that. Second one is maximum lifespan. And that, that is a, a biological construct, all right? How long is it possible for a human to live? And then the third one we'll talk a lot about is physiological functional capacity. That is the ability for you to do what it is that you would expect it to be doing. So we'll come back to that. This gave me an opportunity to put my mom in there. That's my mom. She's picking blueberries because they have a lot of antioxidants, right? She's uh, approaching 90 years of age, and I'd like to be able to say she swims every day, but she doesn't. <laughs> All right, but here are the numbers, and they're rather surprising, and, and this is just for the U.S., right? 5.5 million people older than the age of 85, and the projection is by 2030, we'll almost double that number, and by 2050, we'll quadruple that number. So. Once again, the statistics say this is the fastest growing segment of our population, is the 85 and older. And that's, well, that's okay. That's comforting to me because you guys are going to have to pay for my pills, I guess. Anyway, the, the, the maximum lifespan doesn't seem to be changing despite the average life expectancy at birth, right? Depending upon how you do the numbers, they're saying that a child born today actually has a average life expectancy of over 100 years. Think about that. Okay. Well, we talked about that. And again, this is, this is a, a huge increase. And if you look at some of these statistics over here, you'll see how fast this has been changing over the last uh, half century. Uh, in the United States from 1900, uh, to 2000, it's gone from 47 years of age uh, to, to over 80. So that, that's a big difference. Now, I wish I had little things to give away, you know, people answer the right question. Anybody recognize this guy? Nobody in this room knows this guy. You know, who's that? Who is? Dustin Hoffman. There was a movie a few years back called Little Big Man. And Dustin Hoffman played a character that supposedly was 121 years old. And I had a clip of him talking about his childhood, but it doesn't work. So in any event, this seems to be set. And what I did is I looked up the oldest of the old. And so you can hear, for the guys in the group, the bad news is <laughs> the top ten, they're all women. You notice that? <laughs> And in fact, if you look at the oldest documented ever, uh, there's only one guy, I put him in red, see? <laughs> so, I don't know what, what do you think that's all about? Clean living? I don't know. Well, somewhere between uh, 113 and 115 seems to be the maximum lifespan and it doesn't seem to be located on one continent or within one society or race, uh, but there it is. So, what causes aging and why is there a maximum lifespan? Well, this is, uh, this is the biological side of this, and uh, I don't know that I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, but this appears to be an evolved trait, and it doesn't appear to be something that we're going to be able to escape, and I'm not sure that we'd necessarily want to. Um, 
and we'll look at some of these things. So if a trait uh, is important for survival, uh, and I give an example of the uh, amino acid sequence in hemoglobin. That's a very important inheritable trait. If you substitute, for example, one amino acid, it may uh, inactivate hemoglobin such that it doesn't bind with oxygen or, or it doesn't bind with CO2. So those are traits that are preserved throughout um, evolution, if you will. Natural selection ensures that. And so we almost have to say, well, as, uh, as we get older, what's happening is we're losing, if you will, some of the ability to maintain those traits. But it doesn't seem to be random. It seems to be purposeful. Um, so here you can see some different examples here. This says something about the increase in genetic anomalies associated with older parents. Now, this has been shown to be true both in females and males. Um, it's a process. Um, and if you look at this and you say, well, if we take away modern medical science, then we go back to this average life expectancy of these Spaniards 500 years ago, which seems to be somewhere in the mid-30s, right? So you have reproductive age about 16, and then they are reproductively mature in another 16 years, and by that time, those of us over 30, <laughs> I just, oh, I'm just over the edge, are no longer um, useful, if you will, and we're just taking up space. Now, interestingly enough, the first time I heard this hypothesis was there was a governor in Colorado. Um, anybody here from Colorado? Interesting. The uh, Colorado is one of the youngest populations in the country. Um, anyway, his proposal was that those of us over 60, it was our obligation to go off in the wilderness and off ourselves because <laughs> we were just a burden on society. You know, we're living off our welfare and our retirement. So anyway, there may be some reality to that in the real natural world. So aging, as it turns out, ensures evolution. Right? Once you're beyond a generation beyond reproductive age, then you could argue from the biological perspective that you're no longer mixing in the gene pool. Okay, so on and on about that. I don't know that I, it's with, and the point is without the ability to change, we reach an evolutionary dead end, right? Our, our, our strength as humans are our adaptability to change. Right? There's a quote that says something about change is everything change. And actually there is, uh, uh, there are some other biological um, fields that uh, will support this, that uh, cells can only divide and replicate so many generations. Uh, there's actually a famous book about this, uh, about some immortal cells on the bestseller list. Okay. We've seen this, 41% uh, increase in the number of people living to an age over 90, and there's a 10% decline in the number of people who are over 100, so figure that one out at the same time. Okay, I have a couple slides here that we're gonna jump through, but essentially they are models of aging, uh, the mechanisms of aging and why we can't seem to be able to escape these things. And some of, some of you may have heard this last, last one. Um, there are studies now on the oldest old, right? So in other words, people over 100 are looking at common genetic traits, for example, to see why these people live so long. One of the traits they see of these, the length of the tail on your chromosomes uh, seems to be a, a phenomenon. And the question is, well, can we increase the length of those telomerases. Uh, we, we hear a lot about chemical reactions and free radical theory, and we'll talk a little more about that. But in essence, in essence um, this is what the biologists think of as aging. Now, the other side of that is um, the role of exercise, and that's where we're getting to. Um, we had three definitions. We had average life expectancy at birth. We had maximum lifespan. 
and then we had physiological functional capacity. And it turns of those three, the one that seems modifiable is the last one, is physiological functional capacity. So aging is going to happen one way or another. I don't think we can escape that. So the choice is how, it, how we're going to spend those years that we have. So physiological functional capacity, we start talking about the percentage of an individual's lifespan that um, allows you to do the things that you want to do without compromise. Um, so how do we extend this? Well, again, we have a number of choices, and it's things that we, we all know about. One is prevention and treatment of disease. Uh, the second one is improving your nutrition. Third is, well, this is, a, again, this is experimental and has been done with animals, but it hasn't, well, there are a couple people out there trying to do this, but reduce the amount of food that you eat and metabolize, right? And, and you may have heard that caloric restriction um, has been shown to increase maximum lifespan, but it's not much fun because you have to basically reduce your intake probably 40% at least, not much fun. Fourth one there says reduce superoxide radical formation, which actually dovetails into the last one, which is exercise. So this is a study that has been done on uh, uh, seven-day Adventists and basically showed for any given, uh, let's say, behavioral trait, uh, the increase, let's say, in uh, lifespan uh, that would occur. And, and so, the, so, again, the conclusion is that you do have choices and you probably can influence your lifespan favorably. Um, subject in the general population, 7.3 years or 4.4 years, depending upon who you're looking at and what they do. Those with low risk behaviors increase their lifespan by another two and a half years. And so this is actually one of the populations that has the oldest uh, average life expectancy. Um, they don't smoke and drink. <laughs> All right. Now, um, I always bring up in my classes when I teach a cardiovascular class, there's another theory um, that we all have a uh, limited number of heartbeats. I don't know if you've heard that one. And they all think that, or my students all think that I'm joking about this, and then I bring out, you know, half a dozen papers that exist in, in the biological sciences to say, no, this isn't a joke. These people are actually studying this. Some of the papers now are, in fact, um, suggesting, if you will, what's the break-even point. In other words, when you exercise, your resting heart rate goes down. We call that athletic bradycardia. But while you're exercising, you're actually using up those heartbeats. So the question is, how long should I exercise, given the fact that I'm burning heartbeats versus gaining heartbeats by my resting? It's real stuff. You can look this up. <laughs> but OK, um, we talked about this. Um, there, there have not been. A lot of studies, because as you can imagine how complicated this would be, they have to be longitudinal and they have to sort through all these variables to actually determine what aspect of your behavior contributes to an increase in lifespan. Um, there's a study I, I refer to here, the Finnish man increased their average life expectancy by about two and a half years by including activity. Now the question is, of that two and a half years, how much of that time was spent exercising? <laughs> And that's, and that's one of the dilemmas there. Okay, so aging well versus killing time. So we, we don't talk necessarily about beating aging. And what, what, what we're getting at here is that what we're studying is the, if you will, the effect of sedentary behavior. In other words, what is really aging and what is progressive, I use the word progressive hypokinesis. That's a big college word, you know, it's got like eight syllables in it. So progressive hy hypokinesis. Um, there was a paper, as an example, there was a paper that came out last week that showed the number of hours you spend watching TV 
is a negative risk factor. And you want to go, well, no kidding. But what's interesting is they said it was independent of the mechanisms. In other words, the positive influence of exercise. So in other words, they're saying somebody who exercises, who also spends a lot of time watching TV, they're independent mechanisms. And we'll talk about arterial compliance. The arterial compliance of someone watching four hours of TV a day is the same as, as it, it's irregardless of how much exercise they did. So independent mechanisms. OK. Physiological fun functional capacity has been around about a decade and a half. And, and what they, uh, the original re researchers did is they looked at performances in athletic events. Uh, every time we have a uh, subject in the lab, we're always worried about how motivated they are to perform these tasks. So their thinking was that, well, let's look at uh, trends. And this is what we have on the x-axis is trends in performance based on various events from the 20s all the way through the 90s and look at the slope of the lines. In other words, this, this demonstrates, if you will, the rate of aging or the decline in performance. And it varies depending upon what event we're looking at, whether they're talking about short events that last a half a minute or events that last 15 or 20 minutes. And this graph basically shows you the difference between the active population and the sedentary population. And there's actually, if you look at this, in the mid-range, there's actually an improvement in this physiological functional capacity through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, where the general population is always headed downward. Right now, this is where we talk about the percentage of your lifespan that you're operating optimally. The point is where these arrows are, we're talking about 70 to 75 percent in the active population versus about 30 percent to 40 percent for the sedentary. And for the active population, they can sustain this functional capacity upwards somewhere between the 65 and 70. And then unfortunately, there's a slope there. Um, these are the various numbers here that have specifically to do with athletic performance. But we're eventually going to get to what I need to talk about, symptoms of aging. So all we did was we just lined up the symptoms, what everybody considers the symptoms of aging, and we lined them up against the symptoms of sedentary behavior. So you'll see all these things. Symptoms of aging, a reduced, a, a reduced muscle mass, uh, a decline in immune function, uh, a decline in cardiovascular function, respiratory function, cognitive ability, metabolic capacity, all right? And here's the sign of hypo, signs and symptoms of hypokinesis. And if you look to the list, it's exactly the same list, in essence. All right, so then you say, well, wh wh how much of this is aging and how much of this is low activity? Uh, that's, that's where we are. So benefits of habitual activity, and again, this comes all out of the literature, increase in muscle mass, improve in immune function, improve cardiovascular function, respiratory function, blah, blah, blah. All right. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir again. Um, so let's look at some numbers. All right. We originally started looking at, uh, looking for habitually active people. And uh, um, within our society, we thought, well, let's look at the military uh, because they have to meet certain standards. Well, it turns out, if you think about it, that's actually not a very good population because most of them are only in the military for a few years. And the professional staff doesn't meet the same guidelines as the enlisted people. So then we went and we thought, well, how, how about, uh, you know, police and the firefighters? And it's like, well, guess what? That's not good either because they have very strong unions. And so, you know, you can only imagine on and on and so forth. And so it, it led us back to uh, members of United States Master Swimming. Um, they are virtually religious about it. The first time we got involved with them, we found out that on the average, when we start looking at 55-year-olds to 80-year-olds, they've been involved about 17 years. And it's six, to six days a week, about an hour a day. And that's what I call habitual. All right, so that's like, okay, well, let's look at these. So they spent a lot of time, and, and, and what's interesting here is 
um, if we go over there and look at controls versus the swimmers over here, it's not necessarily the mid-range of activity, it's the high range of activity that they're really, really different, all right? In terms of times, time in, in minutes, um, the control population in heart rates anywhere from 70, 80 to 90 are spending a couple minutes a day as opposed to the master's athletes that are, you know, almost a half an hour a day. And so that's a, that's a big difference. So consequences of this, well, very obvious ones, easy ones to get. If you look at blood pressure, absolutely. There are very, very big differences between the highly active, these are swimmers, and the control population. And it doesn't matter which sex you're talking about, males or females. Um, diastolic pressure doesn't change a whole lot. Systolic pressure is the big winner. And we've got lots of numbers on there. Um, this one doesn't look quite right, but uh, every time we do this, we always have to ask the question, uh, are the men and the women different? We start with that, and if they're not different, then we can pool them, and that increases our N. And this is always the problem in research. Um, it's not the master swimmers or it's not the lap swimmers that are problematic. They, you know, raise their hand, pick me, sign me up, because it reinforces that behavior. It's the sedentary population that doesn't want to have anything to do with this research because they already know they should be doing it. So, you know, it takes us about a year to complete one of these studies with the swimmers, and it takes us a long time to get the same number of control people invested in this. Anyway, lots of uh, physiology here. These are uh, active and, and, and sedentary men and women, and you'll see on the far right there, um, all, this, all the asterisks means those are statistically significant differences. Resting heart rate, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, pulse pressure, stroke volume, estimated cardiac injection time, and uh, arterial compliance. Um, all of them are positive as far if you're a swimmer. <laughs> Pool comparison, just take all the active and controls rather than worrying about differences between men and women. You get the same results. Now the active are on the left side and you have the same sort of thing. They're all significantly different. Uh, blood chemistries, you get the same results. Um, it doesn't really matter about what age. That's the other component of all this. We're not just looking at 55 to 75. We're looking at 30. 40, 50, 60, on and on and on. So it's not, it's not longitudinal. I didn't start this when I was in my 30s. Uh, I haven't been following these people for 50 years. <laughs> but cross-sectionally, we always get the same answer, um, which actually poses another question. It's like, how soon do these differences occur? This last year, we completed a study. We had three groups. We had a group uh, on a club, a club swim team most of them were former swimmers. We had the collegiate swim team, and we had the sedentary or just the normal college kids. And even at that age, at average age of 20, we get astounding differences between the three groups. So astounding and maybe disturbing, if you will, um, both in terms of blood chemistries and some of these things that we can consider structural changes, such as elasticity of the arteries. Okay. Sarcopenia, that is the loss of muscle mass. Uh, uh, that guy's in his 70s, you know, believe it or not. I look like that, but I really don't want to, you know. Anyway, this is a big deal because of uh, your independence and your ability to, to, to do the things you normally do in active living. Uh, that's my mother without her, no. <laughs> anyway, these, I can't, I, uh, that's just such an amazing picture, that's what I think. Okay, skeletal muscle mass is the, same, is the same thing. It doesn't really matter what age we look at. We get differences. So you will note, though, that the slope of the line is about the same. So we're not necessarily stopping aging, but we could almost conclude that they started at a higher point. And the reality is, is again, most of the people, as I said before, in their 60s and 70s have been swimming since they are in their 30s and 40s. So it's, we haven't stopped it, but if there is some kind of a threshold, they will reach the threshold a lot later. 
Now you can actually take and run, as we've done here, a horizontal line there, and you can compute an offset. And if you look at that offset right there, um, that's a 20-year offset. In other words, the 70-year-old master swimmer has the same muscle mass as a 50-year-old in the general population. And that's where you kind of go, whoa, all right, we're talking about 50 to 55 minutes a day. That's worth seeing. Uh, and it turns out that a lot of our data shows the same thing. The offset seems to be 20 years. So if you want to put a number on it and try to sell aquatic activity, that seems to be about it, 20 years. Okay, again, we started thinking about uh, maybe the master's athletes aren't the best people to look at because they're on the far end of the continuum again. So then we started thinking about, well, let's take the lap swimmers in our facilities and ask them to participate. And that's what you're seeing here. It's like, I think it's the green ones that are the lap swimmers. And, and right now we're halfway through with this study, but you can already see they show similar, and in some cases even better responses than the master swimmers are. So that's really encouraging. It's not just about being you know, one of those guys over there in a the barracuda lane. It's like getting in the water, paddling back and forth may be just as effective. Uh, again, arterial compliance. Uh, uh, this is a uh, less well-known, I call it a biological marker. It doesn't mean anything per se at these given ages, but it's a predictor of cardiovascular disease, disease down the road. So that's why we focus so much on this. One of the problems we have here is our numbers are very low, once again, in the control population, but you're going to see that statistically it'll be different. Cognitive function. All right, that's the next step. Uh, again, we're part way through with this study. We've got, uh, we've got the attention of the researchers in the brain sciences and the neural imaging. And so we've been doing some MRI studies on people now who are engaged in this habitual aquatic activity. And you're starting to see the same sort of thing. These are uh, mental composite scores, again, regardless of the age, um, superior to the sedentary population. Uh, we were talking earlier about postural sway, same sort of thing. The master's athletes uh, demonstrate improvements in postural sway. We've done neuro, ner nerve conduction velocity. We get uh, the master's athletes look essentially like the 20-year-old. So there's almost a 50-year offset there. Um, some of the things I can't explain is going to take uh, a lot more time than I've got to explain some of these things. Um, again, same thing, big differences between the groups, and the older they get, um, the bigger those differences become. So, well, interestingly enough, you know, from the physiological perspective, people want to know what, which, what parameter of exercise does this, and we can't answer that question, unfortunately. We don't, there is no unified theory on how exercise influences aging, if you will. Collective evidence, it's all good. We haven't found anything. There's not a single parameter that we've measured that hasn't been positive from the perspective of habitual activity. Uh, these are just, this stuff has been done for years and years and years. Um, I don't need to go into that, but in terms of metabolic capacities, again, it's better. Fitness and wellness, two different things. As I said once before, it's like uh, a, a person who engages in an hour of activity object could still wind up having difficulties if they spend a lot of time watching TV. Um, one of our grad students is now starting to ask the question, what about sitting in a conference at a table all day or sitting in front of a computer screen, right? Yeah, so it may not necessarily be TV. The TV people would probably pay for that, by the way. <laughs> it's not watching TV. It's sitting still, right? Um, this is a, uh, a physical health score based on some very large um, uh, data sets. But you can see, again, USMF stands for the United States Master Swimmers. And the general population, there's a huge decline over time. So this is when we start talking about wellness rather than necessarily fitness. Mental health scores, um, 
general population seems to level out, but you can actually see the master swimmers are actually improving over time, which is, which is curious. They're much more satisfied, happy, happy with who they are and what they're doing, uh, despite the fact that they're getting older. So that's, that's, that's very interesting. Perceived health and well-being, same sort of thing. This one's not too impressive, but you've got a multiple constructs there, and I didn't mark which ones were significant. So, All right, conclusions, because I'm out of time. The difference in terms of aging well is not in the pills you take, but in the lifestyle changes you make. Uh, there are a lot more questions, and uh, the researchers here know the one big dilemma with all this research is that we're not studying sick people. We're studying healthy people, and that means the federal government's not interested in them. <laughs> so. Fortunately, we've been able to get funds from United States Master Swimming as well as National Swimming Pool Foundation to fund this research. Otherwise, we wouldn't, you know, we're barking up a tree that we're not going to get any satisfaction from. Um, but in terms of understanding the aging process, it would be worth some time and funding to do so. So sedentary behavior and habitual activity might be mutually exclusive. That's what we talked about. One, act, one hour of activity might be offset by watching four hours of TV. There are different mechanisms. Longevity, though strongly influenced by genetics, is modifiable by environment and behavior. Well, that's a conclusion. Behavior seems to be add nearly a decade to the average life expectancy, which is what we want, but it's also physiological functional capacity. So we know a lot about the average life expectancy. For eliminated research, functional capacity is better, is increased wellness, non-swimming activity. That's another thing that we, I didn't show a slide of, but it turns out, I think the wording is, uh, I always get hit with reverse causality. You know what that means, reverse causality? It's like maybe because they're healthy, they can swim, rather than because they swim, they're healthy. Yeah, I concede that point, <laughs> but I'm on the other side of the fence. Um, but when we look at the behavioral patterns of the master swimmers, there's no doubt that their activity in other non-aquatic areas is much, much greater, right? So that's a big deal. Aging is a biological, biologically mandated process. Um, being physically active seems to unmask true aging and preserve, I use that word rather than cause a decline in, but preserve cardiovascular, muscular, neural, and cognitive function. Remember the number, 20 years. That's why you want these people to come to your pool, right, 20 years. Perhaps a single mechanism that's been shown in humans to significantly extend life is activity. There are a few, if any, downsides other than frozen hair, in Indiana in February. You don't get that in California, do you? No. Uh, until we find the fountain of youth, uh, we suggest you get in the pool and swim. And you don't have to do interval work. You can paddle along with your kickboard and you'll be just fine. So thanks for your attention. It's cocktail time. <laughs>